word of God for our meditation this morning is the gospel account that we just heard read in the gospel of Mark. I'm going to read, however, the gospel of John's account, and I'd I'd encourage you to open up to your service folders and and read along with Mark as the two stories are read and and play the compare-contrast game. What does what does Mark include that John doesn't? What does John include that Mark doesn't? And see some beautiful pieces uh, of, of wisdom and love that we see in this account of the feeding of the 5,000. Here's St. John in chapter 6. After this, Jesus crossed over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw the miraculous signs He was performing on those who were sick. Jesus went up on the hillside and sat down there with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where can we buy bread for these people to eat? But Jesus was saying this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to have just a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what is that for so many people? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. There were about 5,000 men. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed the pieces to those who were seated. He also did the same with the fish, as much as they wanted. When the people were full, he told his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over so that nothing is wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with pieces from the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the miraculous sign Jesus did, they said, This really is the prophet who is coming into the world. This is the gospel of the Lord. It's not not a surprise that the apostle Mark is a little short-winded. His is the shortest of of, of the four gospels. He is on a race to get to the cross. He doesn't like to spend details. He's kind of like that six-year-old who is telling you his story about what vacation was like. We did this, and then we did this, and then we did this, and then we did this, with absolutely no segues and, and no finesse. It's just an and, and an and, and an and, and an and. This is the Gospel of Mark. John, John's a little bit more finessed. John also, as opposed to John Mark, who wrote the, the short Gospel, John was a literal witness to this. And more than that, he was one of Jesus' best friends. And so he was privy to a lot more information, to to a lot more conversation than what John Mark was. But the stories nonetheless match up, don't they? It's not as if there's a uh, some sort of, of argument that this thing didn't happen because there's a contradiction in the two accounts. They match up just fine. It's just two people, two different people telling the stories. I don't think we need to spend too much time this morning talking about this incredibly familiar story about Jesus feeding the 5,000. We're, we're familiar with it. It's one of the core Sunday school stories, if you attended that. It's, it's one of the more well-known stories of the Gospels, and so we don't need to go too much into the details of it. There are some details, perhaps, some little nuggets that we would like to draw out, though. We can see some doubt in the disciples when Jesus turns to them and says, here's 5,000 people, let's feed them. And you can imagine the disciples standing there with this look on his face going, are you crazy? How do you expect to do this with so many people? And Jesus says to them, well, you go, go figure out how much food we have. And they come back, well, we got five loaves and two fish, Jesus, but how's that going to work? And then you can imagine, as the disciples are gathering around their teacher in front of 10,000 eyes, waiting and watching for this guy to do something, that Jesus gives thanks and says, all right, 
Start handing out the bread, guys. And kind of like that waiter, that server at a restaurant when the food is bad, they grin and bear it as they walk out of the kitchen knowing they are going to take the brunt of people's anger. Particularly these people late in the day who has just made a trek around the lake, it's told, but it's a sea. And they're getting hangry. And so they start passing out the bread. And while none of the gospel writers fills us in on what that experience was like as they're holding the baskets of bread and they keep dipping their hand in and handing it to these groups of fifties and hundreds and saying, here's more and here's more. Would you like more? Would you like more? And they keep pulling bread out of a basket and they're into the thousands of people at this point. And that's just men we're talking 10, 12, 15,000 people sitting on this hill following Jesus. And you can imagine that by the time that the disciples are done, they're exhausted from carrying a basket around, trying to feed these people. All starting with doubt. A few loaves and fish, Jesus. St. John adds an amazingly wonderful little nugget at the end, though. And it's really what we want to focus on today. These disciples weren't breaking off tiny little corners of barley loaves and cutting off little pieces of sushi for these people to eat there on the hillside. The Apostle John adds this phrase, they ate as much as they wanted and when they were full. This wasn't a Lunchable that you can pick up at Quick Trip or Casey's with a few crackers and slices of cheese and like the dad in the front seat of the car on vacation yelling, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. These people had a veritable feast put in front of them. A, a miraculous meal that was placed there, though meager, it's just bread and fish, but... These people came with nothing. Beggars can't be choosers, can they? And more than the meal itself, it was perhaps the atmosphere. As excitement began to grow, that five loaves and two fish began to go past the first ten people. And when it reached a hundred, and then a thousand, and then ten thousand, you can imagine that the dull roar that were whispers coming through the crowd turned into gasps of excitement Because these people weren't really here for the right reason, were they? The Apostle John gives us a clue to that. Jesus crossed over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he was performing on those who were sick. These people weren't following Jesus because they knew what their spiritual condition was like. They weren't following Jesus because they had just heard in their synagogue service a, a little while ago that the Messiah was going to come and they started adding two and two and putting pieces together and saying, this Jesus must be him. In an age when Netflix and Hulu and Xboxes didn't exist, people were looking for some entertainment and boy, oh boy, was Jesus providing it. Up to this point, Jesus had done some pretty amazing things. He's He's calmed the storm with simple words. He's driven demons out of crazy naked guys on top of hills. He's raised dead people from the dead and made them alive again. He's healed the sick. He's made the lame walk and the mute speak and the deaf hear. He's, he's done some pretty amazing things. And so these people were, were following Jesus around thinking to themselves, I can't wait to see what he's going to do next. we can be pretty certain that he blew their shorts off on that hillside. That making dead people rise, <laughs> making lame people walk, and making blind people see, okay, as if that were commonplace, but feeding thousands with just a few loaves and fish. It's no wonder they exclaim at the end, this is the prophet, the one for whom we've been waiting 
But the truth still exists that they weren't here for the right reasons. Are you? Why are you here this morning? I can tell you this. I didn't bring any loaves and fish with me. I don't plan on raising anyone from the dead, nor making lame people walk or sick people well. Are you here because mom pulled the covers off of you in a very mean way this morning and forced you to be here? Are you here because as an adult, mom said to you, you need to be here or else, and there is this sense of guilt, even as a full-grown adult, that I should be here? Are you here out of obligation? Well, Jesus will love me more if I just sit here and grin and bear it for an hour, listening to some guy up front, and we'll get it over with, and it's my good luck charm for the week. Are we here because if we had one, we would have this perfect Sunday school attendance gold star chart hanging on the back wall, and you might be one of those people that if where there was one, you would have a gold star in every single box, and we want to keep the streak going. Can we really say with the, the hymn, the hymnist who, who wrote an incredibly famous hymn, Jesus' priceless treasure, fount of purest pleasure, truest friend to me. Ah, how long in anguish shall my spirit languish, yearning, Lord, for thee. Did you get any sleep last night as you yearned for your Lord this morning? Were you like the kid who is the night before Disney World, popping in at 2 a.m. and then 3 a.m. and then 4 a.m.? Is it time yet? Is it time yet? Is it time yet? Do you see Jesus as a priceless treasure? Or do we see him as one more appointment in the week? Maybe an opportunity to, to ask for a few things that I might need this week. But after all, we're pretty self-sufficient people, us red-blooded Americans. Especially out here in the middle of God's country. We can take care of things ourselves. We don't need much help. And in fact, asking for help, <laughs> that's shameful. That's a last resort. It's okay, God, I've got it. We've got this under control. But perhaps, just perhaps, maybe Jesus is allowing this lesson to be read to you this morning for the same reason that he asked the question of the disciples that day. To test you. You see, the, the disciples didn't ask the right questions. The correct response to what are we going to give these people to eat should not have been, well, I don't know, there's a lot of people here, Lord, and uh, it's getting late, so we should probably send them home. The correct response should have been, well, Lord, you are the Son of God, and you've done some pretty amazing things already. We think you should take care of it. But instead, the disciples go scurrying off on their own, trying to do their own thing trying to take care of themselves without ever contemplating, without ever considering that the one who can only deal with this problem is standing right in front of them. I'm sure you have those problems in your life. Marriages that are strained and a mess. Finances that are scraping the bottom of an empty barrel fear and anxiety about what the future holds for your career or your job or your retirement. Fear and anxiety over death, disease, what this world might be like. I'm sure you have these problems because I do. And Jesus is standing here this morning testing you as well. What are you going to do? Try to solve it yourself? 
ignore the only one who can deal with it in the right and holy and just way? Come to him as a last resort? Dear friends, Jesus is here because he wants to give you everything that you need. He wants you to leave today with the same attitude and the same words that the Apostle John had, that you got today as much as you wanted. He wants to fill you up with his peace and his presence. He wants to give you joy and hope, and he wants to remind you of who he is and, and what he's done for you. He wants to point out that he's more than a lucky rabbit's foot, that he's, he's more than some good luck charm, that he's, he's more than someone who's going to cure our earthly woes, but that he is the one who has given you a hope that is beyond this world, that is full of sin and, and, and full of evil and full of pain and full of hurt. This world, at least in Jesus' eyes, doesn't matter anymore. Because he's given you one better. And he hasn't made you work for it, has he? He hasn't forced you to grovel. He hasn't forced you to, to earn it. He has given it to you freely. On the cross, by his blood, he's given it to you so that you might have life, not here, but in heaven. And it's a constant reminder then. <laughs> it, it ought not slip past us this morning that he, he makes this amazing miracle happen week after week. In the same way that bread and fish multiplied for thousands, how is it that for 2,000 years a single human corpse has been able to feed people's souls to their full as it sits on an altar waiting for you to feast? As you get to leave today full of Jesus and his love and his grace and his peace for you. As you get to leave today knowing that despite the finances and the family issues, despite the politics and the pandemic, despite all the things that are going on in this world, he's conquered it. He's overcome it. And so you have hope in him as much as you want much as you need. And so come today and taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see what he has done for you on the cross. Digest and chew on the love and the grace that he pours out on you every day. And then leave confident that you have hope in him mesmerized, bewildered, in amazement and wonder, the same way that the people were. This really is the prophet, the Messiah. It can't go without saying that this was probably Jesus' best business card that he could give. He's just visited Jairus in the upper room, and there were just a few people there when Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. There were very few who would dare to go up onto the mountain in the Gerizines with that naked man chained in a cave being possessed by demons. There were very few who witnessed that. But you can imagine going home, how many thousands of mouths who had tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord were going to be telling others about it. You have hope. And just like I have financial issues and anxiety, just like I turn on the news or scroll through my Facebook feed and see that this world is going to hell in a handbasket, you probably have friends who have the same worries and concerns too. Which means you have a mouth that has been fed that can also speak doesn't have to be fancy. 
It doesn't have to be eloquent. It can be something as simple as what Philip says to Nathaniel when Nathaniel skeptically sits at the bottom of the tree. Listen, you don't have to believe me. Just come and see. You want to see that the Lord is good? Come and see him. Come and hear him. Come and listen to him. Come and trust in him. And so we leave today hopeful, joyful, exuberant, filled to the full, and completely satisfied in all that Jesus has done for us. More satisfied than a few barley loaves and fish. We come satisfied in who Christ is, what he's done, and what he gives to you. In his name, amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.